Okay, so we're going to go through a series of what if questions. And what I like to do is, uh, is I like to just present these to you and then you can stop your computer, think about it, jot down a couple of uh, possible answers, and then we'll come back on. And I'll share with you what I think probably are the best answers. But uh, we need to be clear about this. Uh, there's a lot of room here for uh, different, uh, you know, different solutions. So the first one is that she starts taking Effexor, and within 12 hours she has an acute onset of anxiety. So what is this and what would you do? Okay, this is very likely to be activation because it's anxiety, it's not mania, it occurs within hours of taking the dose. Uh, the most common thing to do would be then to go in and start treating with a tranquilizer, uh, like Ativan for instance. Uh, with the intention of having that override the activation, and that she is having anxiety, it, it may you know, turn the volume down on that somewhat. Okay, here's our next question. Let's say she's on Effexor. Let's say we've gotten her through at the activation period, but there's no improvement at five weeks. I'd like you to come up with four or five reasons that are possible candidates for the reason that she hasn't responded. Okay, well, let's take a look at, at the, uh, the possibilities. <clears throat> uh, you know, what are the usual suspects here? One of them is that actually she is starting to improve, as we've discussed earlier in the class. Uh, you know, her, her kids notice it, her husband notices it, but she doesn't uh, because the, the, the magnitude of improvement is, is uh, small, but it's, it's clearly there. But because depression leads to uh, pessimistic and negative perceptions, oftentimes people who are clinically depressed uh, will be uh, improving, but they don't really notice that. What they notice, they continue to really focus on uh, th their suffering. And so uh, we've talked before about the use of rating scales to help her get some clarity about the fact that in fact she may actually be responding. And if that's the case, that will uh, the use of rating scales can help her do some critical thinking and restore some degree of hope. But let's assume that that's not the issue, okay? That really and truly she is not improving. So what are some other possibilities? Well, let's take a look at them, okay? Uh, Non-compliant, and keep in mind that non-compliance can be not taking the medicine, discontinuing it, but also often non-compliance is simply not taking it as prescribed. And there are a lot of people who forget doses or they get a bit of a side effect, so they, they cut the dose down themselves. We're going to talk a lot more about non-compliance here in just a little bit. The wrong class of medications, okay? Well, it may be that if you continue to optimize the treatment, treat aggressively with, in this case, Effexor, you get up to a maximum dose if she can tolerate the side effects, and we have less than 25% improvement. And that's suggesting probably uh, biochemically we're shooting at the wrong target. And so the option here would be to consider switching. And uh, there, there's a, the, the currently only one FDA-approved drug that treats uh, or targets dopamine, and of course that's Welbutrin. Uh, also keep in mind that Welbutrin increases norepinephrine and Stratera, uh, technically an antidepressant, but FDA approved for treating ADHD uh, is a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So those are two choices that we might go to. If she has, let's say, 10% uh, improvement after, after five weeks on the effects, or especially if you go out even a couple more weeks and it's in that ballpark, that's not enough uh, to, to warrant staying on the medication. Now, if she had 30% 30, uh, 30 improvement, you probably wouldn't want to Stay with the effects here and augment, add the well be turned to that. Uh, unreported substance use or abuse, and this could be, uh, of course, alcohol. People have a lot of embarrassment and shame about that. Uh, you know, again and again, I, I've been you know, caught off guard completely, not even suspecting that, and people will report, well, actually, uh, Dr. Preston, the, the truth is I, I am drinking a lot of wine or something like that. But uh, under here, we also need to consider the use of energy drinks and uh, coffee, tea, and other sources of caffeine. And a lot of people just think, well, you know, this can't be a problem at all. You buy this over the counter, it's no big deal. But as we know, it can really destroy the quality of sleep. Uh, the dose may be inadequate, in which case we need to progressively increase the dose, uh, making sure we don't knock her over with side effects. She may be a rapid metabolizer, and so it's hard, it's hard to know that ahead of time. But it, if she has, let's say, 25% improvement, uh, 
it may be that she just is, is uh, her liver is just metabolizing this so rapidly we get inadequate blood levels and so it's going to be important then to uh, consider well she may be a rapid metabolizer in which case what do you do you increase the dose and you can go beyond the, the usual therapeutic guidelines and see if that works and then of course uh, increased psychosocial stressors uh, is, is oftentimes an issue other things she can be a late responder we know because severe depression uh, early onset first uh, first depression in childhood early adolescence she she does she has that kind of history uh, and also severe symptoms suggest it's more likely that she's going to respond later uh, than sooner so uh, waiting somewhat longer may may be you know something to consider under psychological issues boy this is a huge you know I don't have to tell a psychotherapist about this it's one of the biggest problems that, that treatment of primary care doesn't work because even if the medication is helpful obviously if there are ongoing significant psychological issues that needs to be addressed and recent onset of a medical illness causing psychiatric symptoms uh, we said at the beginning didn't look like she had any, any medical problems but chronic depression it's always worthwhile to have a person get a physical and at the very least uh, get a thyroid panel and complete blood workup to see if that is a factor that may be contributing to the lack of response Okay, so what if six weeks into this and uh, we're, we're using Effexor and we push it up to a high dose, okay? And so she's taking it. We think she, that we've ruled out all those other causes that may interfere with this. We're really, uh, you know, confident that, that she's taking the drug as prescribed and she has 35% uh, decrease in symptoms uh, as rated on a depression rating scale. What do you do? Okay, what do you do? Assuming she's tolerating the medicine, if you go beyond 25% improvement on one drug and you've maxed out in terms of time and dose, then you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because uh, what you see here is some benefit from this. And it's, you know, it's nothing to write home about, but it's not insignificant. And so this is where instead of switching, it would be uh, wise to augment, add another drug to the current antidepressant. And finally, uh, let's talk about what if it turns out that on further investigation that she has bipolar disorder. And uh, you know, there's lots of ways to, uh, you know, to really ask many, many more questions to try to uncover this. What would be uh, the uh, first line or standard treatments for treating bipolar depression? Now, it's really beyond the scope of this class to go into great detail about this. It's enormously complex, as you know. <clears throat> but let me run through... Uh, the typical first-line treatments and why they may or may not be a good choice. What you see, <clears throat> excuse me, what you see on the screen are the four uh, medications that have a track record of efficacy in treating bipolar depression. Now, how about using antidepressants <clears throat> uh, along with uh, either by themselves or along with uh, one of these mood stabilizers? What are the issues? Well, one thing is with bipolar 2, uh, Symbiax, which is one of the four drugs up there, has an antidepressant in it. It's got Prozac in it. And so there, you know, if a person chooses that drug, you're going to be treating with an antidepressant. Uh, there have, there's been a couple of recent studies that show in treatment-resistant bipolar 2 that if you use... Uh, clinically significant doses of mood stabilizers and they're still depressed that about 25 percent of these people can be then treated with an antidepressant and get some benefit without there being a disaster okay and the American Psychiatric Association is very clear about saying that you would never use an antidepressant by itself the risks are too great uh, so some of these people have bipolar 2 are uh, may benefit from now, if they switch into a hypomania, that's not a big deal. I mean, enjoy three days of vacation or something like that. Uh, we don't have the problem about manic episodes. But uh, this other bullet item here, unanswered question about cycle acceleration. Now, the jury is really out on this, and there are studies that follow people over a very long period of time. And during times of antidepressant exposure, there are more frequent episodes. And so we don't want to throw gas on the fire. So I think that uh, I think that... that it's reason for pause before thinking about antidepressant, but uh, 
just you know, in summary, never to be used alone, never to be used with bipolar one, never to be used if there's rapid cycling, and really shouldn't be used with bipolar two until the other options have really been addressed. How about bipolar three? She's got a lot of episodes. I mean, if she's if this is the truth, fifteen or, or twenty episodes, and especially if they are episodes that are of short duration. Now her current uh, depression is four or five months. Uh, that well, that's that's somewhat short, but especially if they're, they're, the episodes are two or three months, uh, that then would suggest even more strongly uh, bipolar three. The big problem here is if you use an antidepressant, watch out because this person has never had manias and now something's happened and they've got them big time. So uh, it's probably uh, much better to avoid antidepressants with this group. And if she's had a period, even one period during her life where there was rapid cycling, then again, you would want to stay away from antidepressants. So let's look briefly at the four major choices here, okay? First off, Seroquel. Well, there's a reason that it's moving to the top of the list for the following reasons, some of which we talked about in class earlier. It's uh, the only antipsychotic that increases brain-derived neurotropic factor. It's well tolerated compared to the other drugs. Uh, it, it, it is anti-manic, so it's kind of a safety net in case somebody uh, you know, uh, flips into a mania, it may prevent that. It's uh, beneficial to sleep. It can really put people to sleep, but very importantly, it increases slow wave sleep, which is uh, what you really want to do, especially in long-term treatment of uh, bipolar disorder. Uh, the downside is, of course, metabolic syndrome, and it's misspelled on your slide there, but I think you know what I mean. And that can, of course, be, over the long run, really dangerous in terms of health consequences. Okay. Uh, what about lamictal? Well, here, here are uh, a, lot of, a lot of things in the plus column. Uh, the, the downside would be that you've got to slowly increase the dose to avoid uh, severe rashes like Stevens-Johnson syndrome. It's not likely to cause mania by itself, but there are, rep there are case reports that it may provoke mania. Uh, so it's got a lot to be said for it, but it's got some uh, problems as well. Uh, Symbiax, uh, let me count the ways <laughs> that it's a problem. Uh, you're locked into a particular dose. You can't really manipulate the two drugs very easily because they're all in one capsule. Uh, it contains Prozac, antidepressant for the reasons, but the, and, and a huge issue is metabolic syndrome, but in particular weight gain. And keep in mind that Zyprexa can cause between one half and one pound of weight gain per week. And with obesity rates being higher than normal in, bi in bipolar patients, and also she's already very overweight, that it would not be a good drug of choice. Uh, lithium, the biggest plus for her would be, in addition to being a good mood stabilizer, is really protection against suicide. And I think, I think that really argues for having that be a part of her, her medication uh, treatment, uh, maybe along with other medications. However, Let's go down to the cons. You got to do a lot of lab tests. Side effects, we all know, are oftentimes difficult to handle. But here's someone who's real suicidal. You're giving them a drug that if they take a tiny overdose, it can kill them, and there's no antidote. So where lithium could be enormously beneficial, uh, you know, in the long run, in the startup of that could be uh, risky, uh, especially because she's feeling suicidal. And there you go. Okay. Thanks for listening.